Hey guys, what's happening? It's Jay from Sony Alpha Lab, and what I got here is the Sony RX100 Mark 7. And what I'm gonna go over in this video is the mode dials. There's a bunch of different modes on the RX100 Mark 7, just like the other RX100s, and I wanted to break those down for you in this video for those looking to get the most power out of their RX100 Mark 7. This camera is extremely powerful, has a lot of different modes here, and you can do a lot of different things with these modes, depending on your skill level and what you're trying to accomplish. So below the video, I'm gonna have navigation links for each mode. So if you're looking to learn a specific mode, just go below into the description area and just click that you know little shortcut and it'll bring you right to that mode where I cover it so you don't have to watch through the whole video because this is gonna be a pretty long video. Before we get to the tutorial on the modes, please do me a favor and hit that subscribe button below the video and the little notification bell next to the subscribe button. That will send you an email every time I come out with a new video so you'll keep up to speed. If you just hit subscribe, it's not gonna send you the email and you'll have no idea that I came out with a new video. So that's what that little bell is for. In addition, give me a thumbs up. If you think this is a good video, you got something useful out of it, please give me a thumbs up, share the video with your friends, that'll really help me out. In addition to that, below the video in the description area, there's also links to the gear I used in this video, accessories that I recommend for the RX100 Mark 7, and clicking those links really helps me out, so I would greatly appreciate that. And let's get on with this video. All right guys, so the first mode we're gonna go over is auto mode. And auto mode is great if you're a beginner and you're new to the camera and you want the camera to do everything for you. The auto modes on the Sony cameras are extremely intelligent and they will do a good job for you pretty much 90% of the time. So don't be afraid to use auto mode. When in doubt, you know, if there's a, something you're trying to take a picture of and you don't know what the best setting would be, just put it in auto and the camera will do a great job, like I said, 95% of the time probably. So let me just show you one thing quickly. On the top left, you can see it's in auto mode and it's it'll basically recognize the scene. It'll recognize items in the scene. In this case, it sees what it thinks is a face, because it is a face on like a little figure there. So it's putting it in portrait mode. And if I press the shutter down, it's gonna focus on the face. See that? And if I remove the face, notice how the icon on the top left changed. Now it's just looking at the scene. It's like, oh, there's a car there. Let me focus on that. It's gonna focus on what's closest to the camera if there's no faces in there. If you throw a face in there, it's gonna say, oh, there's a face. Let me switch to face mode. Now, if you're taking a picture of a mountain, you're gonna see a little mountain icon up there because it's gonna recognize that scene as a landscape, and then it's gonna optimize the camera for landscape settings and take the picture that way. So it's an extremely intelligent mode. Now, over here on the right side, there's a button that says FN. If you hit that button, it'll bring up this screen called the function menu. And on the lower right-hand side, is the auto mode option. There's actually two modes for auto mode. There's right here, intelligent auto, automatically identifies the scene's characteristics and shoots a photo. And then you have superior auto. Superior auto is better for lower light stuff where subjects are backlit or the lighting is just really low. And basically what superior auto will do, it'll also recognize the scene just like the other auto mode, except when the lighting is low, it'll take multiple shots. So it'll fire like boom, 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 boom. It'll take multiple shots. Another icon will pop up and it'll take multiple shots. Now notice I just touched the screen. If you touch the screen on this camera by default, it's gonna enable touch to focus. So you gotta be careful when you do that because if you enable touch to focus, the camera's only gonna focus where that little rectangle is. And if you forget or you didn't realize that you did that, it's gonna mess you up and it'll mess your shots up. But notice up on the top there, there's a little hand with an X just tap that with your finger and that will cancel the touch to focus. And you can also go into the menu and turn touch to focus off if you want, if you keep doing it by accident or whatever. Also notice the it recognizes that the camera's on a tripod. That little icon right there is a little camera on a tripod. So it knows the camera's on a tripod. Now if I was hand holding the camera, it's gonna move around and it's gonna go away. Now see how that icon changed? It recognizes that the camera's moving. Like I said, this camera is extremely intelligent and it'll accommodate for that. It'll speed up the shutter speed because it knows that you're hand holding as opposed to it being on a tripod. So when in doubt, switch it to auto mode. Now, if you're in low light situations, go to superior auto and it'll help reduce the noise by taking multiple shots. It'll also help reduce blur by taking multiple shots and then it'll composite those images 
and create a nice, sharp, clean image. Now, to get that composite image, you do need to be in JPEG mode as opposed to raw quality. Now, if I hit this function menu, menu again, you will see you have an option here for file format. That's your quality that your image is taken. JPEG is basically the camera is doing all the processing for you, and it's just going to pump out a fully edited image for lack of a better word. You could still tweak the image and edit it in post-processing, but not near as much as raw quality. Raw quality gives you more power, more dynamic range to work with, but it's pretty much unedited. So you will need to, you know, add, potentially add a little sharpness, contrast, color, and so forth. But there's much more editing latitude when you're using raw quality. However, in auto mode, you are limited if you're using raw quality and you won't get a composite image using this awesome superior auto mode. You really gotta be in JPEG mode. And honestly, if you're a beginner and you're using the camera in auto mode, you should probably be in JPEG mode anyway because you're probably not gonna be doing post-processing and the files are much smaller and so forth. Also notice on this function menu when you're in auto mode, a lot of these features, these boxes are grayed out. As you will see, when we switch to a different mode, the boxes will you know, become illuminated with settings that you can change because you gain power as you go into the more advanced settings. So it's locking down the camera here to make it much simpler for you if you're newer to the camera. So that is auto mode. All right, let's move on to the next one. All right, so the next mode I wanna go over is P mode, and that stands for program auto. So program auto is basically full auto, except you get more power and more options. And what I mean by that is if you hit the function menu here again, that FN button, look at how all the options are there. So you can now change your metering mode, you can change your focus mode, you can change your drive mode, and all sorts of stuff like that. Your white balance, you can change your creative mode. These are all different modes now that you have access to. Exposure compensation, ISO. So those options are not available in full auto mode. It takes all that control away from you. But what's cool about P mode is it, the camera will basically still do everything for you. So it's not as advanced as the full auto modes are as far as taking multiple images like the superior auto mode and stuff, but it will still select the shutter speed and the aperture for you. And if you have the ISO set to auto, it'll select all those settings for you to give you a shutter speed that it feels will give you a sharp shot. And it, again, is gonna do a great job 95% of the time. This is a great place to move to if you're looking to get a little bit more experienced with the camera settings and you wanna get off full auto mode. All right, so the next mode I wanted to go over was scene mode. I could just go in order, but I actually wanna go in order of, I don't know, what I feel will make more sense to a beginner. So scene mode. What scene mode is, is it'll basically you select what scene you're working with. And notice how on the bottom there, it's showing you a picture, a little icon, it says SCN for scene mode. And if you turn the dial, it'll switch scenes. And up here on the top left is the particular scene mode that you're working with. And there's all different scene modes. This mode is for food photography, obviously, because there's a fork and a knife. And there's all these different modes. This is pet mode. So it'll change your focus area and all sorts of stuff like that. And it'll optimize the camera for pet photography. Now you have, like, like I said, there's tons of modes, backlit, nighttime, twilight, all sorts of stuff. And it'll change, like I said, it'll change all sorts of camera settings to accommodate whatever given mode it is. Really cool feature. And there's all different modes. Like I said, flowers, mountains, landscapes, sports mode. Notice how it says it put the camera into rapid fire mode here right there, and you're now you're shooting autofocus continuous, and it put it in rapid fire mode, so it's gonna go boom, 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 boom. It's gonna take multiple shots, because it's now in sports mode, as compared to flowers. Now flowers, it's gonna take one shot at a time, and it's single AF, so it's just gonna focus lock and then take the shot. So that's much different than continuous autofocus. And this is a great place for you to go if, again, you wanna get off full auto mode or a full auto mode is not picking the correct scene, if you're actually in a sports environment, for example, and it's not picking sports, you can go into scene mode. Here's portraits, a lot of different scenes here. So that's basically scene mode. Now, if we go down one more, we have panoramic mode. Now, panoramic mode is really cool because you could basically sweep the camera. So in this case, it's set to the direction of down. But if I go into the menu, you can go down here on page one and you have panorama direction and panorama size. I'm gonna to go to the right, cause I like to go from left to right. 
and I'm going to leave it at standard, but you also have the wide option. And that'll just be a wider panoramic. So now what it's telling you is you basically start your shot like this and you start shooting and then you go, it, it, it continues to fire and you go all the way to the right like this and you take a sweeping panoramic and that will then stitch together all those images and pump out a panoramic photo. It's really hard to demonstrate in this small area I'm working with, so I can't really demonstrate it. But you can see the arrow, and I'll show you the effect. It's probably not going to work because I'm not going to be able to properly sweep. But basically you go like this, and you can see on the bottom it's showing you the size of the panoramic. Now it looks like it actually worked, which is kind of shocking. Alright, let me hit the play button here on the bottom and see what that looks like. And there we go. So you can see it stitched together that panorama. And then it stitches it all together for you and gives you this final panorama, you know, polished shot, let's say. So this is great for those vast views when you're on top of a mountain and things like that. Panorama mode. Now again, you can change the direction. So, so if you go to the up direction, for example, like so, if you're shooting like a tall tower, you could then start on the ground and to go bang, 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 and shoot your way up. You just rotate the camera and you can get like the whole tower and get a vertical panel. Or you can hold the camera like this and you can still sweep and shoot in that direction and get a panorama that way, which will create a slightly fatter, you know, panorama and not quite as wide. So that's an option as well when you change your direction. So it's it's very powerful feature. Now we have high frame rate mode. High frame rate mode is slow motion video. So this option is extremely powerful if you're trying to capture stunts or anything like that, or you want to capture anything in slow motion. I mean, you could use this feature for so many different things. In order to manipulate this setting, you have to go into the menu and you got to scroll over and you will see there's a high frame rate mode option in the menu. High frame rate settings, it's on page one in camera two. And when you go in here, you got your different record settings. Now, this is going to be a quick crash course here. I'm probably going to do a full video on high frame rate mode and give a little more detail, but I just want to show you the basic concept here. So this is going to be your output. So the, vid the video output is going to be 24p at 50 meg. You can go in there and change that to 60p, 30p. But I prefer 24p. Now the frame rate that it's going to record at is 480 frames per second. That's what I currently have it set to. The best quality is 240. The worst quality is 960. 480 is, is really good as long as there's good light. 240, I would recommend starting there. Now the key to high frame rate mode is good light. The better light you have, the brighter your scene is, the better quality this is gonna look. Because you, if you're shooting at such a high frame rate, you really need to have good light or else the ISO Basically, the camera sensor sensitivity is going to have to be really high. And the higher the sensitivity is, the more noisy and grainy the footage is going to be. So better light, the better the slow motion effect is going to be. So if you're going to do some kind of stunt or anything like that, or you're going to, you know, whatever you're going to do, whatever your goal is with the high the slow motion video, just try to prioritize your timing so you can have the best light possible. You don't want to use this feature in low light environments, it's going to come out like crap. Now, priority setting, you have quality priority and shoot time priority. You will get longer recording times if you go to shoot time priority but I prefer quality priority most of the time. Record timing. So these are the different types of record timing. So basically when you hit the record button, these options here dictate when the recording will start. So if you have it set to start trigger, when you hit the record button, that's when your video will start recording. 
If you have it set to end trigger, which is what I prefer to use, the camera is buffering the whole time in high frame rate mode. Let me show you. So right now it's telling you to check exposure, focus, etc. So you get everything set up, you're good to go, and then you hit the center button. Now notice how the camera says it's preparing. So what it's doing right now is buffering. So now the camera has the video buffered. So it already has footage buffered. So if I hit the record button, when it's set to end trigger, it's gonna record what's already buffered. So for example, if there was a stunt happening in front of me, you know, like uh, somebody, whatever, was trying to jump over something, they would jump over something, I would then hit the record button, and it would, you would hit record after they jumped over it. And, it. and then it would go back in time and record that footage because it's buffering right now. Versus start trigger. Start trigger, when you hit the record button, it starts recording at that second. So the difference is, it records like in the past, end trigger. It'll record like the previous four seconds versus recording four seconds from the time you hit the button. That's what end trigger versus start trigger means. So I can't go into the menu right now because I'm in that buffer mode. So I have to hit the center button. Notice how it says return to shooting setting. So you hit the center button. Now it's back to shooting setting. And this now this is where you can control the zoom and stuff like that. So you have to have the camera all set up. You have to have the focus where you want and everything's gotta be good to go exposure wise and everything. Then you hit this center button and that's when the camera gets starts buffering and gets you into that state. And up here on the top left is showing you the trigger setting you have, the start trigger, and I have it set to end trigger right now, right here, end trigger. Now end trigger half is basically the same thing. It just won't go back in time as much. So for example, if the camera's recording for a total of four seconds, end trigger will go back a full four seconds and then record all that footage. End trigger half will go back two seconds, record those two seconds in the past, and then record two seconds in the future. Start trigger will just record from the moment you hit the record button and then continue recording. So that's what these options mean. But I found end trigger to be the most effective because, for example, I took pictures of Layla swinging a bat. I would wait until she swung the bat and actually hit the ball, and then I would hit the record button, and it would go back in time four seconds and record the entire action. That seemed to work best for what I was doing. So that's high frame rate mode in a nutshell, guys. All right, so let me move to movie mode. Now this is movie mode. So in movie mode, the camera changes and it'll show you audio levels. Whoops, I just hit touch to focus there. See how it says focus cancel? You can hit this button here in the center of the dial or you can hit this button up here, the little hand with the X, either or. So you can hit this button here to cancel the focus or you can you know, touch that little hand with the X. So in movie mode, you have a couple of different options. Right now it's showing you that it's in program mode. So if I hit this function button again, that'll bring you into these shortcuts. Notice how the function menu has changed. Because I'm in moving mode, the functions that are in this menu are now optimized for movies. So you have microphone level, you have the steady shot mode, currently it's in active. You have picture profiles, which is basically the gamut format that the camera is recording in. Right now I have that turned off, white balance and so forth. Touch to focus, you can turn that on and off right there. And then over here is the mode that you're currently recording in. So I'm on the mode, I have that highlighted. It's exposure mode. But then if you go over here, you click that, you can scroll and change to aperture priority mode, shutter priority mode, or full-fledged manual mode. So you have all these different modes within movie mode. So what I wanted to show you is touch to focus. So if I just aim this camera down a little bit, like so, I could zoom in a little bit. And then if I hit record, all right, the camera is now recording. I can touch to focus, and it's now going to focus on that car instead of the face. You can see the face is slightly out of focus now. And then if I touch on the face, it's going to switch the focus automatically to the face, and it's going to transition nice and smoothly. So movie mode is awesome, especially with touch to focus in combination. You can do those really cool transition effects, and it works really well. If I go into the menu, let me just stop recording here by hitting the record button. And if I go into the menu, you have a bunch of different options for video recording. This right here is your mode, like I just showed you. You can get to that in the function menu. 
but down here is your file format. So I have it set to the best quality right now, which is 4K. Now that it's in that mode, if you go to record settings, these are the different frame rates you have when shooting in 4K. And this is the best quality 24p at 100 megabits per second or 30p at 100 megabits per second. If you change it to 60 megabits per second, you will get more recording time on your memory card at a slightly you know, less quality, of course. So if I go back to the menu, change my file format to HD here. Now if I go down to my record settings, I'm going to have many more record options here. Notice that. I have 60p, 30p, 24p, and 120p. 120p will give you pretty darn good slow motion. So you can use this feature as well for slow motion. And it works really well, and it's in 1080p. So. Crazy haircut. What's cool about 120p, in particular with the Sony RX100 Mark 7 and the other RX100s that offer this feature, is that you also get audio. Let me see your cool moves. Come on. <laughs> so you can slow down your recording and then, you know, chop up your video. And when you speed it up, to regular speed, you will have audio in your scene. So that's a great feature. A lot of other cameras when they're doing 120 don't record audio. Now you can also control your autofocus drive speed and your autofocus tracking sensitivity and auto slow shutter. These are also more advanced settings that you can change while in movie mode and it will affect the way your video behaves. Drive speed is basically how quickly the camera will focus from one transition to another. If you have it set to slow, it'll be more cinematography. Fast will be a faster transition from one side to the other, one focus point to another, let's say. I like to leave it at normal for the most part. And that's basically movie mode in a nutshell. All right, so the next mode I wanted to show you is the MR mode, which stands for Memory Recall. So Memory Recall is a very powerful feature, and basically what it does is you can program it to remember certain camera settings. So, for example, I have option one here set to Aperture Priority, and I have the Aperture set at f2.8 and a bunch of other various settings. So you can set multiple settings here and then recall them. And M1, M2, M3, and M4 are memory cards. You can actually save to the memory card these particular slots, and then you can take the memory card out and use it in another camera and recall, recall the settings from another camera. Or you can bring a memory card from another camera, put it in this camera, and it'll bring up the settings based on what the other camera had. So this is great if you have multiple cameras and you're trying to, you know, speed up your workflow and make sure that other shooters that might not know what they're doing, for example, are using the right settings. You could just be like, hey, use memory one for this or use memory two for that. That's what those are for and they will write to the memory card. Let me show you how this works. So right now that's memory recall one. So what I wanna do is I wanna change the camera mode to let's say we're using aperture priority mode, for example, okay? Now I'm gonna zoom in and I have it on that face. I'm going to turn the dial to change the aperture on the bottom here to f4.5. And that subject's a little bit too close. All right, right there is good. So I want to program this as my memory recall setting. So what you got to do is you got to hit menu. You go into the memory option right here. It's on page four on the camera one. And then you hit this little center dial here. And then it says enter here on the bottom right. So it's going to enter these settings. So it just registered that, like so. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my aperture to like f11 or whatever. I'm going to zoom out, and then I'm going to switch to memory recall mode. And look at that. It just recalled option one just by switching to this mode. So now if I go to shoot, it's right where it was. You see that? It zoomed into the actual optical zoom I had it at and all the other settings. Even though my camera was set, if I go back to aperture priority mode, it's back to F10. You see that? 
So it switched the aperture back to where it was, but it left the optical zoom where it was. So that's how memory recall works. It basically will recall your settings that you had the camera set to. So uh, for example, let me go into shutter priority mode. I can change my shutter speed to something really slow. Like let's put it at a quarter second, for example. And then if I go into menu, memory, go to slot two, and I'm just gonna hit enter to register. So now I registered it. Now, let me go back to memory recall mode. And if I go to memory recall two, you could see now it's in shutter priority mode, one quarter of a second, or I can go into aperture priority mode, the other one I programmed. So I have these two ready to go. So now if I hit the shutter button, it's in shutter priority mode and it's at one quarter of a second where I had the settings set. So that's how memory recall mode works. It's, it's a really great mode. It's great if you want to have your camera set up for sports or something like that with a fast shutter speed or a slow shutter speed if you're trying to get a blurry effect like fireworks, whatever the case may be, blurry water. And then you could have it the another mode set up for aperture priority if you're taking portraits, things like that. So that's how memory recall mode works. All right guys, so for this mode we're going to cover aperture priority mode. Aperture is the size of the lens diaphragm. It basically controls the depth of field and also the speed of the lens. So right now at the zoom that I'm currently at, the fastest aperture is f4. If I zoom out, I could now turn the aperture wheel and I could go to f2.8, which is the fastest aperture at that focal range. So let me zoom back into this face a little bit. And it's at f4. Now aperture controls the speed of the lens, which ultimately dictates the shutter speed and what ISO you will need to be at to capture your image, depending on how much light is in your given scene. The faster the aperture, the better in low light scenarios. So also what aperture does though, is it controls depth of field. Notice on the face on the left, how it's blurry because of the depth of field. And now I'm too close. Let me just zoom out just that little bit. All right, so I'm focused on the face there in the front. Now the face in the back is really blurry, but watch what happens when I raise the aperture value. It's going to increase the depth of field. So now the face in the background is becoming more sharp. You see that? That's the depth of field. So basically, the higher the number here, the larger the depth of field is going to be. That's why when you turn the dial and you have it at f4, the depth of field, like this, the distance, the sliver of sharpness becomes less. And that's why that face in the background is getting more and more blurry. And you control that depth of field with aperture. And the closer you get to the, your subject, the more blurry the background's gonna be. And aperture priority mode lets you control the aperture and it measures it in what's called f-stops. The lower the number, the more light that's gonna get into the sensor and the lower the ISO is going to need to be when in that mode. So right now it's registering ISO 640, see that? Now watch what happens when I raise the aperture up. Now it's registering ISO 5000. And I'm just pressing the shutter button down halfway to focus. So you see at F11, the ISO, the, the sensor sensitivity, it needs to be at 5000 in order to get a proper exposure at that 1 60th of a shutter speed. So now if I turn the dial down to F4, now it's saying ISO 800. So for this particular lighting, ISO 800 is required to get a shot at f4 and have the shutter speed at 1 60th of a second. That's basically how aperture priority mode works. Now let me show you what shutter priority does. And that's what S mode is. And if you guessed it, it controls the shutter speed. That's right, shutter speed. So now if I turn the dial, notice how the shutter speed is changing and the camera is automatically changing the aperture. And when I was in aperture priority mode, I was changing the aperture and the shutter speed was automatically changing. So if I want to get a slow shutter speed, I can just turn this dial and get a slow shutter speed. Now you can only go as slow as the camera can handle without it overexposing. And that's why it's blinking now, because now it's overexposing. And you can tell when it starts blinking that it's overexposing. This is as slow as the shutter we can go and get a proper exposure. If you wanted to get a, a slower shutter speed than that, in the lighting environment that we're currently in, you would have to put an ND filter in front of the lens. And basically what that is, is it's tinted glass. So you would basically be putting sunglasses in front of the camera and that would slow the shutter down more 
because you'd still want to get a proper exposure, but in order to do that, you would have to slow the shutter speed down more because shutter speed ultimately is time. Think of it like a clock. And the more time it takes for the light to get into the sensor is would mean a longer shutter. And that's basically what shutter speed does. So if you have a slow shutter speed, like one third of a second, you're not gonna get sharp shots if you're hand holding. But if you're on a tripod like this and you're trying to capture motion, like something like this, something like this spinning thing here, watch what happens. See how it's all blurry? Because one third of a second, the fan or the little you know spinning wind ornament thing here was able to spin around multiple times, giving you that blurry motion capture. And that's what you can do with shutter speed. You can change your shutter speed to a slower value and get that spinning effect. Now this works awesome if you're on a tripod. Again, if you're hand holding, it doesn't work so good. You're gonna end up getting blurry shots. But if you're at like a carnival and there's one of those cool, you know, those spinning rides that have lights on them, if you have a tripod and you, sh you set your shutter speed to something slow, like one or two seconds, because in those environments, it's normally dark out, so you can get really long exposures, you will get super cool, blurry spinning shots. And you could also do it with car tail lights and things like that. I'll actually show you a sample photo of some tail lights with a 30 second exposure on a highway when I was on an overpass. And 30 seconds, you're really gonna get some pretty cool blurry light effects. And also shutter speed. If you, so if you were taking a picture of your kid playing sports, you would want a very fast shutter speed, something like 1 400th, 1 500th of a second, and that will freeze the action. So watch this. If I spin this thing now and take a picture, it's gonna freeze it because I had a shutter speed of 1 500th of a second. See that? It's pretty darn sharp because it froze the action. One five hundredth of a second froze the action. Now it was a little bit too close to the camera for it to actually focus on the camera. It was still focused on the face, but you can see even though it was spinning like this, it froze it and it looks like you know a still moving subject. That's because the shutter speed was so fast, one five hundredth of a second, it was able to freeze that action. So shutter priority is a great way to go when you're using, you know, when you're shooting sports. The last mode I'm gonna cover here is manual mode. Now manual mode is the most powerful mode because it gives you full control of the camera as far as the exposure triangle goes. Now the exposure triangle is aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. Those three things are the exposure triangle. So right now I have the camera set to auto ISO. So I want to take that off auto ISO. If you hit the function button, you can go in here to your ISO settings and then you can set it to a hard value. So I'm gonna set it to ISO 100. So right now my image just went black and it's like, whoa, what happened? Well, it's showing you what the exposure looks like if you have the camera set like this. So at 1 500th of a second in this lighting environment at ISO 100, that's gonna yield a super underexposed shot. And you can see right here in the center, blinking, there's an MM there. That stands for metering. That's the camera's metering. So it's letting you know that it's beyond two stops underexposed. So what we need to do is we need to slow that shutter speed down. Whoops, I hit the wrong button, sorry. So right now it's changing the aperture. So I can ch change the aperture to f2.8 and that brightened up the scene a little bit, you see? But it's not enough. Now it's telling you there, if I hit the down on the, on the turn dial here, the bottom is down. If I hit that, it'll switch to the shutter. See if you hit down how it's switching between aperture and shutter. So now I'm controlling the shutter speed. Now look what happens when I slow the shutter down. The exposure is starting to come back. And if you look at the meter mode there, it's getting to a proper exposure. Now at negative one and right there, zero is a proper exposure. So let's check out, let's change the aperture now. So if I raise the aperture up, now it's underexposed again, so I'm gonna to need to sh slow my shutter speed down more in order to bring the exposure back up, like so. Now that's to get a proper exposure in this lighting environment at ISO 100, I'm gonna to have to have my shutter speed at 1 13th of a second. Now that's not good for anything that's moving. I need a faster shutter than that. So to get a faster shutter in this lighting environment, what I need to do is I need to raise the only other value that I can raise, and that is ISO. Now I could also change the aperture and make it faster. I want to keep it at f5.6 because 
I want that depth of field. I want, you know, the image to be sharp. You know, I want that sliver of depth of field to be sharp and I want it to be at f5.6. So I need to change the ISO value. So if I go into the function menu and click on ISO, I can raise it up. So let me raise the ISO up to like 800 and you can see it's overexposing right now because I need to raise the shutter speed up. So if I turn the dial, I just got to hit down to switch to shutter. Now if I raise the shutter speed up, so again, I'm decreasing the amount of time that the shutter is going to be open for. Because remember, shutter speed is time. So now the shutter is only going to be open for 1 60th of a second. And that's going to help freeze the action because a faster shutter is going to help slow down any kind of moving motion. So if you're hand holding, you're going to want to have it at like 1 60th of a second approximately. And in order to do that in this lighting environment, I need to have the ISO set to 800. Now again, you can, you can leave the ISO in auto mode and it'll automatically do that work for you, but you lose that full power ability. That's what I wanted to show you what it looks like without auto ISO and what it looks like when you have it set to a hard value like ISO 100. Now, if you're in the field and you're trying to capture blurry taillights on a car or something like that, for example, you could use shutter priority mode, that's the easier way, or you can go into full manual mode. And I would recommend doing that. And I would put the ISO value as low as you possibly can so you get the cleanest possible shot. So in this case, it's telling me I need to be at ISO 640 to get a sharp shot of that portrait, of that face, like so. So let's change the aperture. Or let's, that was the shutter speed, so I need to hit down. Let's raise the aperture up. I want to have it at f11 because I want to try to get that face in the background a little bit more sharp. So now it's at f11. Now I need to be, you look, it says ISO 2000. And again, that's because the aperture controls how much light comes through the lens because it's like the pupil of the lens, the aperture. So now right now I have that pupil really small at f11. So if I open it back up to f4.5 or whatever it's at, f4, now the eye of the aperture is much more open. So the amount of light coming in is way more. And because of that, the ISO is way less. Now it's at ISO 320, so that'll yield a much cleaner image. All right guys, so just to wrap up manual mode, what I wanted to show you was how you get into bulb mode. And if you're coming from a different camera system, this might work a little bit differently. But on the Sony's to get to bulb mode, you have to be in manual mode. And basically what you do is you just gotta turn your shutter speed and keep turning it slower and slower and slower and slower until you get all the way up to 30 seconds and then it switches to bulb mode. So what bulb mode is basically you just hold the shutter button down and however long you hold it that will determine your exposure. So if I hold it for two full seconds it'll take a two second exposure. Now to do this mode you really got to use a shutter release cable or in this case what I'm using right now I have this little a tripod that has a button on it so you can just hold that button and take the photo and this is the VCT SGR1 grip that also turns into a tripod it's a pretty cool little grip and notice how it plugs in with the USB cable into the camera and that's how you can control it from the grip you can also zoom with this thing it is a little bit expensive it's like $98 for this grip it's kind of a, a little bit much but there's also a more affordable solution this shutter release cable here is the RM VPR1 it's also a little bit expensive, but uh, it works really good, and it has a lock like so, and you can just lock the exposure like that, and it works really well, and it's a little bit easier to get no camera shake because you do not want to be touching the camera at all when you're using bulb mode. Any kind of touch, you know, shake or whatever, you're going to see. So this is a really good solution, and you also have a zoom on this, a record, and on the side you can turn the camera on and off. And it hooks up to the USB with this cable, just like the other grip here. So that's pretty much how you use bulb mode, and that's what bulb mode does. So you have to be in manual mode, and then you just turn your shutter speed all the way until you get to bulb mode. That's basically a crash course into manual mode. And that pretty much covers the mode dial on the Sony RX100 Mark VII. Now, I went through this pretty quick, guys, so if you have questions below, please just ask in the comments area and I will be happy to help you explain things a little further. And I'm still working on the full review for this camera, so I will also cover 
more material in the full review, but I wanted to do an, a pretty in-depth mode dial tutorial here for those looking to get more power out of their camera, you know, right away. So there's a lot of other features I still need to cover on this camera, so stay tuned for that. And also be sure to check out my autofocus tutorial where I break down the autofocus system on this camera and that'll really help you out if you're struggling with those concepts. That is pretty much it for this video. I really hope you got something out of it and please let me know what you think in the comments area. Again, if you have questions, ask below and also be sure to subscribe. Please give me a thumbs up if you like this video. I could really appreciate that thumbs up. It'll let other people know it's a quality video and it's worth checking out. All right, guys, I'll catch up with you next time. Have a great day.